Hey everyone, how you going? Hope you're having a wonderful day. I've said this before, and I'm not a medical expert, and I don't I'm not giving any advice or anything like this. But I'm going to share some news that should concern a lot of people. All right? Claws Shop, the UEF humans are now hackable animals and will be re-engineered on 7th of March 2022. Now I've read about this in that uh, book that uh, I uploaded to share the Great Reset. It goes for five hours, and he speaks about it in that. So humans are now hackable animals, according to an advisor of Claus Schwab, who had issued a chilling warning that humans are no longer possess free will and are set to be re-engineered by Bill Gates. Dr. Yuval Noah Harai, an official WEF contributor, was recorded delivering a speech in which he explains that Claus Schwab means what he says it is you who are changed. According to Dr. Harry, Swab is referring to humanity and the sudden evolution that the elites have in store for the rest of us. In my past, many tyrants and governments wanted to hack millions of people, but nobody understood the biology well enough, Harry says at the start of the video. And nobody had enough computer power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo, neither the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will, ha will be able to systematically hack all the people. He goes on to say, before dropping a chilling threat, We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. But Dr. Hurry says this merger of human life with technology will not benefit the average man or woman, so he says that he and she may improve his or her future, but that a handful of elites will not only build a digital dictatorship for themselves, but gain a powerful power to re-engineer the future for itself, for future of life for itself. Because once you can hack something, you can also engineer it. If the elites are successful in re-engineering humanity, it will have to decide whether our da data of our DNA, brain, body and life belongs to me or to some corporation or to the government or perhaps the human collective. Of course, Bill Gates is involved. Harry says that cloud technology such as IBM or Gates' Microsoft platform will be one of the driving forces of this evolution. Humans are now hackable animals, says Dr. Harry at another point in the video. The whole idea that humans have this soul or spirit and that they have free will or that nobody knows what's happening inside of me. So whatever I choose, whether I whether in the election, whether in the supermarket, this that's, this is my free will. That is over. Free will, that's over, he emphasizes. Today we have technology to hack human beings as a, on a massive scale, Harry goes on. To say, adding, everything has been digitalized, everything is being monitored. In this time of crisis, you have to follow science, Dr. Hari argues. It's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste because a crisis is an opportunity to do, also do good reforms that in normal times people never agreed to. But in a crisis, you see, we have no chance, so let's do it. And this has been fact-checked if anyone wants to say, no, 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 that wasn't said. This this is out of the book. You know, that, if only people could see what's coming, you, you would understand how I feel and, and what I'm trying to express to you people. Gene Patton's overturned in landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision. 17th of the 6th, 2013. A landmark decision in the U.S. Supreme Court and the Association for Mol Molecule Pathology in My Aunt Genetics case would appear to have overturned three decades of gene patent awards, singling a clear shift from the Patent and Trademarks Office past practice. Nearly 20 years ago, My Aunt obtained several patents after discovering the precise location and sequence of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, mutations of which can dramatically increase the risk of breast and ovarian cancer. This knowledge enabled Maillard to develop medical tests for detecting mutations of these genes to assess the patient's cancer risk. The validity of the patients was challenged by a consortium of interest parties. Cancer patients and medical associations were anxious to reduce the cost of such genetic testing, which can run as high as US $4,000. 
Scientists raise concerns over restrictions on their ability to use the genes for research and the impact had on the flow, free flow of scientific information. On the 13th of June 2013, the Supreme Court held that naturally occurring DNA segment is a product of nature and not pattern eligible merely because it has been isolated. However, synthetic genetic material known as complementary DNA or cDNA can be patented because it's not naturally occurring. This means that Maya no longer has the exclusive rights to isolate an individual's BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, but it can claim exclusive rights to synthetically created BRCAC DNA. Until the ruling, Maya held a monopoly on testing for the BRCA genes, an issue was, which was recently brought to the public's attention with actress Angelina Jolie's announcement that she had a double mastectomy after testing positive for one of the genes. The U.S. Patent Act, Section 101, permits patents to be issued uh, permits patents to be issued to inventors or discoveries of any new or useful composition of matter. But the court held that the laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas are basic tools of scientific and technological work that lie behind the domain of patent protection. The court explained that without this exception, there would be a danger that would grant patents would tie up the use of such tools and inhibit future innovation premised upon them. This would be at odds with the very point of patents, which exists to promote creation, Thomas J. concluded. Delivering a unanimous, unanimous judgment for the Supreme Court, Thomas J. emphasised that patent protection strikes a delicate balance between creating incentives that lead to creation, invention and discovery, and impending the flow of information that might permit, indeed spur, invention. This standard was used to determine whether Maillard's pat patents claim a new and useful composition of matter or claim naturally occurring phenomena. Maillard's DNA claim was found to fall within the law of nature exception. While Maillard found an important and useful gene, groundbreaking, an innovative or even brilliant discovery, its extensive effort was not enough to satisfy the new and useful composition of matter requirement. Maillard did not create anything with isolating DNA, according to Thomas J., as separating the gene from its surrounding genetic material was not an act of an invention. However, the cDNA at issue is not a product of nature, as a lab technician created something new and complementary to the BRCA gene, making it patent eligible. While seen as something of a compromise, this ruling could have profound implications for biotechnology and the drug industry. Myad's patents was due, were due to expire over the coming years due to the 20-year limit on patents, but the decision has implicated implications far beyond the scope of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 patents. Concern has been raised that it could discourage investment in genetic research by taking away commercial incentive to continue researching into DNA. Some biotech research companies saw it as a turnabout turn in the international approach to intellectual property rights surrounding genetics. The U.S. Supreme Court decision forces a change at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which has been awarding gene patents since 1982. It also contradicts a ruling on gene patenting in Australia's federal court in February this year, which decided in favour of Mayan after a similar lawsuit was brought by Cancer Voices Australia. The federal court ruled that two genes extracted from natural cells obtained from the human body and purged of other biological materials constituted a manner of manufacture and therefore could be patented. That decision has been appealed to the full court of the Federal Court, with a hearing expected in August. The Australian Federal Court is not legally bound to follow the US Supreme Court decisions, but will no doubt closely examine the US Supreme Court decisions on its deliberations. I had a few issues finding um, the report from the hearing in August, because this was in 2013. So Australia, you know, said yes, we'll patent it. USA said no, but you see, C DNA can be patented. So all they have to do is change one little part of your DNA, and they own you. In a case of 
June 2013 is the case of Association for Molecular Pathology, Maya Genetics. The Supreme Court in the United States ruled that human genes cannot be patterned in the US because of DNA is a product of nature. The court decided that because nothing new was created when discovery in gene, there was no intellectual property to protect, so patents cannot be granted. Prior to this ruling, more than 4,300 human genes were patented. The Supreme Court's decision invalidated these genes' patents, making the genes sex accessible for research and commercial genetic testing. The Supreme Court's ruling did allow that DNA manipulation, which is the cDNA, in a lab is eligible to be patented because DNA sequences altered by humans are not found in nature. The court specifically mentioned the ability to patent a type of DNA known as a complementary DNA or cDNA. The synthetic DNA is protect, produced from a molecule that serves as an instruction for making proteins called messenger RNAs. Do you see where I'm going with this, people? In the 1980s, the Supreme Court ruling ruled that a living human-made microorganisms could be patented by their developers. The ruling opened a gateway for cells, tissues, genetically modified plants and animals and genes to be patented. In the past 30 years, more than 40,000 patents have been granted on the genes alone says medical ethicist Harriet Washington in a new book, Deadly Monopolies. Washington details how our tissues and genes are increasingly being patented by pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. Those firms, she argues, are focused more on their profits than their medical needs of the patients. Restricted patents on genes prevent competition that can get, keep the medical costs of the treatment down, says Washington. In addition to genes, she also points to tissue samples, which are also being patented, sometimes without the patient's detailed knowledge and consent. Washington details one landmark case in California in which medical viable tissue samples from a patient's spleen were patented by a physician overseeing his treatment for Harry cell leukemia. The physician then established a laboratory to determine whether tissue samples could be used to create various drugs without informing the patient. The patient was told that he had to come to the physician's lab for tests in the name of vigilance to treat his cancer and keep him healthy, says Washington. The man, a man named John Moore, was never told that his discarded body parts could be used in other ways. He sued the doctor at the University of California where the procedure took place for lying to him about his tissue and because he did not want to be a subject of a patent. The case went all the way to the California Supreme Court, where Moore lost. In a decision, the court noted that Moore had no right to share any of the profits obtained from anything developed from his discarded body parts. If there his cells and medically viable agents are being derived from its, his body, it seems intuitive to me that he should be the one to decide what's done with it, says Washington. I think we can forget that money is not the only question here. Money is important for the corporations. Money may be less important to the patent, patient than his body integrity and about his rights to inform consent and his rights of autonomy to choose what should be done with his body. Another patient, a hemophiliac, was told by his doctor that his blood contained a highly concentrated amount of antibodies that could be highly valuable for other patients. He started a company to market his blood but he also gave his blood away for free to other companies and non-commercial researchers. Washington writes that the patient rewrote the rule book by understanding that donating and selling tissues is not a mutually exclusive. The relationship between universities and pharmaceutical companies. Before the 1980s, it was rare for university researchers to obtain patents on their products, says Washington. She points to Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine. Edward R. Murrow said to Salk, this jab is going to be the great demand. Everyone's going to want it. It's potentially very lucrative who holds the patent. And Salk said, the American people, I guess. Could you patent the sun? This was the norm, he says. Since the 1980s, researchers at the university in the pharmaceutical industry have been becoming collaborators in ways that they weren't before, says Washington. The 1980s Bardol Act gave universities and small businesses control of the intellectual property which allowed them to sell their patents. Before the 1980s, most researchers worked within a university culture which encouraged free discourse without necessarily a potential product in mind, she says. It encouraged collaboration and data sharing and values held by medical research. researchers were values of academic excellence, medical achievement and altruism. These were the motivations. Now that the patent 
is based upon the value of exclusivity, the corporation discouraged very strongly and prohibited data sharing. This culture of corporation has taken over the medical research culture. And you notice there's no, no more peer-to-peer review studies ever done. Have you noticed that? The last 20 years, that's just dropped off. Universities get money and support from pharmaceutical companies for their research efforts. In turn, a pharmaceutical company can potentially buy or license a patent for molecule or gene from the researcher, which is even more lucrative, says Washington. Once they have done that, they will hopefully emerge with a medicine, says Washington. Now they can decide what to charge for it. And in this country, they can charge anything they like. She notes that the relationship between universities and pharmaceutical companies is different now than it was in the past. Very often, medical researchers would not sell a patent. They would hold on to the patent on the medicine and not sell it to anyone, which means that it could still be manufactured and sold by corporations, but they had no exclusivity, she says. The pharmaceutical companies could not charge this astronomical price because consumers could simply go elsewhere for it. Washington is also the author of Medical Arthropod, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award. She has been a fellow in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School and a senior research scholar at the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee University and a fellow at Harvard School of Public Health. So that's very interesting, isn't it? I'm not going to read this one because I think this one will get me struck down with what is written in it but I will leave the links in the description for you to read this one if you're interested in synthesis of complementary DNA cDNA is only accomplished in the laboratory i.e. outside the body the first step is to isolation of a natural mRNA from the body as described above mRNA as derived from DNA does not contain introns, i.e. non-coding basic regions of DNA because the introns are removed during the natural synthesis of mRNA. For the purpose of cDNA synthesis in a laboratory, mRNA has an entirely different function than it does in the body. In the body, the mRNA serves as an immediate intermediate in the process of building a protein. On the other hand, in the laboratory, natural mRNA mRNA can be used as a template to build a strand of complementary nucleotides to the mRNA template. The natural mRNA is added to a solution containing a very small string of nucleotides, oligo-DT, shown here, known as a primer, which will combine with the mRNA to initiate a double-stranded molecule. A solution of a single nucleotide basis with all four types, i.e. ACT, and G included, is added at the mixture along with an enzyme called reverse transcripts. This enzyme facilitates the stepwise addition of the individual bases to the chain of complementary fashion to the basis of the mRNA template. The result is a double strand of molecule consisting of the mRNA template combined with a newly synthesized complementary sand, strand. Another enzyme, RNA-SE, is added into the mixture to degrade the mRNA, leaving only a single strand of DNA complementary to the original mRNA. Another enzyme, DNA polymerase, is added again to facilitate complementary base pairing. This time, with a newly synthesized but now single-stranded DNA, this result is a double-stranded cDNA molecule made up of strands synthesized entirely in the laboratory. Since cDNA is built entirely from mRNA, which does not contain introns, non-coding base regions, the cDNA necessarily does not contain Proven's already protect individuals from invasions of their bodies via menacing physical contact and action necessary for acquiring DNA without permission of its host. Battery is not only a tort but also a crime. The safeguard comes without the requirement of recognised ownership as the body is a statutory subject of a tort of battery. At the same time, no court has said it's so because someone owns their torso. The genome, as part of the body, is included in the interpretation of such laws and thus cannot be removed from one's cells without consent. And that's why you gave consent. It's sad. It's really sad. It's really sad that lots of people... Senator Chuck Schumer recently kicked the undercurrent of paranoia about DNA testing up a notch in press conference filled with inaccurate information. He said 
Here's what many consumers don't realise, that their sensitive information can end up in the hands of unknown third-party companies. There are no provisions. And many companies say that they can sell your information to other companies. And if you, of course they do it. Don't think that, that your 23andMe genetic testing is going to be thrown in the rubbish once you've had it done. No way. They're going to sell it. How could you be so naive to think that? Why would you do that in the first place? Let's unpack some of this using the article on Gizmo, Gizmodo as an example. It contains inflammatory statements like you're giving up unfettered access to your information about what makes you you. This statement is wrong on a number of levels. First, you're not giving up unfettered access to anything. You have complete control over your D, how your DNA companies use your DNA. Not really. You can choose to be paired to potential relatives or not, or you can opt out of research programs that could lead to medical breakthroughs, and you can delete your results whenever you like. It'll be deleted on your end, but it won't be on theirs. On a biological level, the statement is ridiculous for two reasons. First, your genome contains roughly 3 billion units of DNA, and most of it is identical to other humans. Only about 10 million of those units are SNPs, pronounced SNPs, or short for singular nucleotide polymorphous meaning they are very among people. The DNA test we do for genealogy only looks at about 500,000 to 700,000 SNPs. So of the 10 million units of DNA that differentiate me from the rest of humanity, the test only took 5% to 7%. Second, fewer than 10% of the SNPs that the genealogy testing companies use are known or suspected to have any effect on us. The vast majority of our DNA has no function at all. That's right. Most of those SNPs don't contribute anything to what makes you, you, for example, SNPedia, a wilkie for genetic if, information, listed only 107,582 SNPs as of 3rd of December 2017. The criteria for listing a SNP in the wilkie is doing something worthy of recording. In other words, the other 9,892,000 418 SNPs in the human genome don't do anything that we know of. Ancestry DNA looks at a fewer than half of the SNP, PDA SNPs, and the other companies examine even fewer. Thanks to Dr. Anna Turner for pointing me to the SNPedia page that lists how many genetically meaningful SNPs are tested by each genealogy company. But there's more. The Gizmo author writes, The breadth of your rights you are giving away to your DNA. When you spit in that vial, it's kind of crazy. And there's all the fine print. Testing companies can claim ownership of your DNA, allow third parties access it, and make your DNA vulnerable to hackers. Aye, First, the fine print states that you own your genetic information, with one possible exception. More on that below. And other companies do not allow third parties to access it without your permission. Well, that's not quite true. It says true. Anything online is vulnerable to hackers. But what the heck would a hacker do with a function of your genome? Which most has no function. That's not true. That's not true at all. And the last beef with Gizmodo, uh, one last beef with the Gizmodo uh, article. Before I move on, it says 23andMe, for example, sell anonymized data from your genetic code to its research partners to help put all the genetic data to use looking for cures to diseases. That's used most people probably wouldn't mind, but the research partner could, in turn, share your anonymized data in a research journal, and it's possible someone might identify it. The author of this piece has obviously never tried to identify someone using DNA alone. If it was so easy, the DNA detectives' Facebook groups wouldn't have more than 72,000 members, each of whom spends weeks or months or years trying to identify a single biological parent. The author has clearly never researched, read a research journal. Your raw data f file from one of the testing companies contains literally hundreds of thousands of rows of texts just for fun. I opened one of mine in Microsoft Word and the program stopped counting pages when it got to 10,000. The type of research study that could lead to medical research breakthroughs would involve thousands of participants. It takes a special kind of something to think a journal will actually publish millions of pages of raw data even if ethical guidelines allowed it, which they don't. Okay, selling your genetic information. Let's cut to the chase. Can companies sell your DNA information to third parties? Yes, they can. 
All of them, including wording in their policies, allow them to share our gene- sell our genetic information, but only if you agree to let them do what's in that fine print. Ancestry DNA terms and condition. Any sharing of genetic information for external research purposes pro- proposed is governed by the informed consent. 23 million privacy policy. We do not sell, lease, or rent your individual information, i.e. information about single individual genotypes, diseases, or other tract traits, characteristics, to any other third party or to third party research purposes without your consent. I have heard that these DNA companies in America have sent the genetic information to private health fund providers stating that, you know, this person has a, a potential genetic, you know, problem and that those people have lost their health insurance. I've heard that one. My heritage privacy policy, we never sell or license DNA samples, DNA results, DNA reports, or any other DNA information to third parties without your consent. Ah, yeah, sure. Family tree DNA privacy policy. Gene by gene respects your privacy and will not sell or rent your personal information without your consent. Personal information includes but is not limited to names, phone numbers, physical or mailing address, email address and genetic test results. Gene by gene is the parent company of the family tree DNA. In summary, all four companies have the exact same policy with respect to sharing or selling our data to third parties. They do it only if we give them permission. Permission is granted to a company when you opt into their research program. Who owns your genetic information? Again, I'll let the company speak for themselves. None of that the rights guaranteed in their agreements and are what they need to prove, provide the ethnicity, ethnically estimates and relative matching that we pay them for. Ethnicity. So ancestry DNA, terms and condition, ancestry DNA does not claim it. Any ownerships rights in the DNA that is submitted for testing. Any genetic information, your DNA and information derived from it, belongs to the person who provided the DNA sample, subject only to the rights granted to ancestry DNA in this agreement. 23Me, in terms of service, any genetic information derived from your saliva remains your information, subject to rights we retain and set forth as in terms of service. My heritage terms and conditions, we do not claim any ownership rights in your DNA samples, the DNA results, or genetic information. So you get my point. Like, they say they don't, but behind your back they will. Behind your back they will. I'll leave this one in the um, links. There's another article about it, so I'm not going to keep reading on because I think you get my point of view where I'm going with this. So, there's another one about the gene patterns, scientific studies. Um, Ancestry, five reasons not to take a DNA test. Privacy, if you're considering genetic testing, privacy may well be a concern in particular. You may worry that once you take the DNA test, you're no longer owning your data. They say you do, but yeah, I I do not believe that. I'm not sure what you get. We look into your DNA test. It's not always clear what you could learn about yourself and your family. With an ancestry DNA test could tell you Results which over 500 plus regions of the world your ancestors probably came from. Don't want to connect with strangers. Of course, you may not be interested in connecting with the undiscovery family. See, now they say they don't share information, right? How, okay, if they don't share information, um, here, and uh, goes on. There is so many, um, <laughs> there is so many cases where. Your DNA has been shared. It'll be shared to the government. That's that is one hundred percent sure. It's going to be shared because they're building up a DNA database all over the world. That's been going on since nineteen seventy three here in Australia. 
in Australia, like they not only take your footprint when you're born, which is your soul, they own you. They also take um, a heel prick and three drops of blood go onto a card and that goes to Canberra. Um, so basically they take a DNA sample at birth. So these, these, there's women... Um, she f- took a spit, spit test kick and, and found, uncovered a killer in her family. All right, so if they didn't share that information, how did they find out about this killer? She entered a DNA contest, submitted a photo of herself, dressed as a ballerina. Um, she posted her DNA and were used to share the results. 2018, the Golden State Killer was arrested in California after family DNA was used to identify a suspect from a crime scene. <laughs> there so many. So, what do you do about it? I don't know if this is actually a good point, but I, I'm starting to think you could. I'm starting to think that something like this might help you. Genetic code copyright. Get it signed and witnessed by, like here in Australia, a justice of the peace. And once you have it signed by a justice of the peace, um, I'm sure you could take it further in courts. That you've you've gone to the step of, of taking your DNA back, claiming your DNA, and putting a document out there stating that. I own my DNA. That's, I don't know. The following information must be provided to proclaim genetic copyright of ownership from your personal genome with a genetic copyright code form. You must also have someone witness your act of signing and fingerprinting this form. No, you may be one of many people who do not know or are unsure about the information on your oranges. oranges. No matter, you are original human and entitled to stake a claim on your own genome. Simply enter in not known or appropriate wording where it applies to complete the form. So the following information, you enter into it. So you enter your whole birth name or any name you've taken to identify yourself, your birthday, your day, your month, the year of birth, town, state, country of birth. Enter this information on the line provided, e.g. Washington, D.C., USA. Note if town, state, country locations don't apply, enter a location description, e.g. TWA flight 843 Mid-Atlantic Ocean. Your mother's name. As you're with your own, you may use her full given married name or any that she used to identify herself. Probably put the maiden name too. Um, father's name, and your father's name as per the instructions cited by Proclaimer. This line is for your signature. You must also add a fingerprint in ink in the same area through this act of making the proclamation and any replication of your personal genome requires the authority of your permission. Note, a single f- print from any finger is sufficient for identification purposes. If you are unable to provide a fingerprint, Substitute another suitable imprint or mark. To personalize your document, you may select. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Witnesses. This line is for the signature of a person who witnessed your signing and fingerprinting. The witness must fill in the blanks and provide it in the witness area for the date and place of signing. A notary public can act as a witness to include an official seal to the document, but it's not necessary, but I would be doing it. Anyone you choose as a witness is sufficient. They will also add their fingerprint to their signature. This is an optional gesture. So you've taken the initiative to copyright your own DNA off your congratulations, certified original human. Now, you do this with your will, don't you? You write your will at home and you sign it and then you get thumbprint it. Why wouldn't you try and do something to claim your, your DNA? No one's got my soul. My soul belongs to the Lord. Um, it was taken years ago and my certificate of baptism says that. I don't know, but my certificate of baptism doesn't state anything about my DNA. I don't know how it will hold up. I don't know. 
but it's something I've been thinking about for a while, that this DNA stuff, it's going to be, it's not going to be good for humans, not going to be good, anyway, wherever you are in the world, thanks for watching, I might do a live stream and add more to this, I'm not sure, thanks for watching, raise your vibrations, have a good day, much love, bye now.